Thank you. I'm uh, Patrick Jay. I'm the Dean of the Homeless School of Business. And so uh, it's my honor to uh, welcome all of you to uh, BSB Center for Business Analytics lecture series. Um, this growing field of business analytics has become an integral part of the decision making processes for many organizations. Uh, business analytics provides the tools and methodologies to leverage data to make informed and creative business decisions. Uh, recognizing the importance of the field, we established the Center for Business Analytics, uh, one of six of our BSB centers of excellence uh, about five years ago. Um, and so it's become a central part of our, our strategy in the business school and something we think differentiates us from uh, our, our uh, fellow competitors in the field. Uh, we're fortunate to be joined today by our keynote speaker, Tom Davenport, a uh, renowned thought leader, author, professor, uh, and consultant who has helped hundreds of companies worldwide, worldwide to revitalize their management practices. As the Center for Business Analytics celebrates its fifth anniversary, it's fitting that Tom uh, joins us today since he was here almost five years ago to the day uh, to help us kick off the Center's lecture series. So thanks for being with us today. I uh, appreciate that. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Matt Libertor, Director of the Center, and Tom Coughlin, the Center's Business Fellow, who provided leadership for the Center and its programs, as well as uh, Sharon Ballard, who assists them in, in their efforts as well, some of our other centers. So at this time, I'd like to turn the uh, program over to Dr. Matt Libertor, <laughs> J John F. Connolly, Endowed Chair of Management, and the Director of the Center for Business Analytics, who will introduce our honor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. It is my great pleasure to have as our speaker for the fall lecture series for the Center of Business Analytics, Dr. Thomas Davenport. Tom is a renowned thought leader who has helped many companies worldwide uh, improve their management practices, and he has an interest that span business, research, and academia. And serves as the President's Distinguished Professor of Management and Information Technology at Babson College. And he's also serving as a visiting professor at the Harvard Business School for the 2012-2013 academic year. In addition to those uh, impressive credentials and titles, he's also a co-founder and research director of the International Institute of Analytics. Tom has written or co-authored 14 books, including several firsts in the area of big data and analytics, business process reengineering, and knowledge management. His concept of analytics and big data as a competitive differentiator was initially introduced in the Harvard Business Review article, a very well-known article, and our students, software analytics students who are reading that this semester, competing in our analytics and is one of HBR's 10 must-read articles in the uh, General's 90-year history. Together with two highly acclaimed books, Analytics at Work, Smarter Decisions, Better Results, and Competing on Analytics, The New Science of Winning, they have been cited by CIO Magazine as one of the all-time 10, top 10 most groundbreaking management books. And his work on analytics is credited with sporting a new breed of organization. His most recent book, Judgment Calls, 12 Stories for Big Decisions and the Teams That Got Them Right, was named one of the top 10 business books of 2012 by Publishers Weekly. Tom is currently working on a new book on analytical thinking, tentatively titled Numbers Fall. In terms of his academic background, Tom earned his PhD from Harvard University in Social Science and has taught at the Harvard Business School, the University of Chicago, Dartmouth Stuck School of Business, and the University of Texas at Austin. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Tom Davenport to all of us in the Villanova community. Thanks. Nice to be here again. It's. Um, I, I know I can always count on if I uh, wait a couple of years or even a few months and come back down to Villanova that some uh, interesting things have happened in the interim with regard to analytics. Uh, Villanova was one of the first universities that I observed anyway that had 
created a center for this sort of thing. So you are um, all to be commended for um, either starting this thing or supporting it over time, whether you're a student or member of the, of the corporate advisory board. Um, so one of the, I guess, challenges if you come to a place uh, fairly often, as I have at Villanova, you have to come up with some new things to say. Um, so uh, I am not sure what I, what I would have done if the whole big data topic hadn't come up. Uh, I was previously talking about, uh, I guess, small data analytics. Nobody likes that term very much, but I don't know what else to call it in, in contrast. Um, and so what I've done is taken my last presentation and every place where I said analytics before, I, I'm doing the same presentation, but now it says big data. So uh, I'm sure you'll find it a totally different experience. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, I initially did suspect that there was uh, some old wine being poured into new bottles in this regard, but um, oh, I lost one of my, my microphones here. Um, but then I actually started doing some research and I found that there, there are some substantial differences. So I'm going to tell you about my um, intellectual journey in that regard. Um, so whether you're talking about uh, um, small or big data, you have a whole set of organizations who are adopting these approaches. Uh, um, some quite old companies, General Electric, over 100 years old, Procter & Gamble, just uh, um, uh, that old as well, Marriott, American Express, these uh, very traditional companies have said, you know, we think that not only analytics, but I think in all of those cases, big data is really critical to our future success, so they've embraced it very aggressively. Uh, uh, Middle-aged companies, I don't know about Google, they're 12 or 13 years, maybe, that doesn't really count as middle-aged, I guess, but uh, companies have been around for a while, but really, in, in many cases, established with the idea of analytics at their core. Certainly that's true of Google, Capital One in banking, um, eBay, Netflix, a lot of these online companies just could never have succeeded without their uh, approaches to analytics and now big data. But you have a whole host of new companies. I did not actually, uh, I'm sorry to say, interview any uh, startup big data firms in the Philadelphia area, but I suspect you have some. A lot in the Bay Area and San Francisco, uh, some slightly smaller in Boston. I think San Francisco has the lead in online uh, businesses, social network and, and so on, oriented to big data. Uh, Boston, I think, has the lead in healthcare big data startups. Uh, New York, quite lively in terms of, of startups, particularly related to advertising, social media and so on. Uh, a few in other places that I've found, but these are mostly companies that you probably never heard of. I think you know, we may well hear of them in the, in the future. And then um, technology companies of various types. SAP is now getting more new revenue from analytics and business intelligence than it is from its uh, traditional you know, transaction processing capabilities. And then you have companies like Teradata and EMC and IBM that have bought uh, a large uh, number of companies in the analytics and big data space to extend their capabilities. So um, really a pretty dramatic demonstration of the fact that this has turned out to be a, a popular topic. So what I um, want to do with you this afternoon is talk uh, uh, very briefly about some of the small data analytics frameworks that I had been working with, uh, that, but then I'll spend most of my time talking about big data, um, uh, compare and contrast big data and small data analytics, and, and depending on how much time is left, uh, talk about some things that are in common between the two. Um, I think my talk was billed as discussing the um, sexiest job of the 21st century. Uh, I will be talking about data scientists in that regard, but it's, I think it's impossible to talk about them on their own without some general sense of what's happening in the world of big data. But um, uh, I want to make clear, these are not the sexiest people of the 21st century, it's the sexiest job of the 21st century. So 
Um, many of the data scientists I have, I have met uh, would not qualify by the conventional definition of, of sexy. So, um, so uh, I, er, early on working on analytics, concluded that if, if you wanted to be good at this, you needed to do certain things well, and I was a little slow to realize, you know, people kind of need something to remember in this regard. Finally, I got, got it and came up with this delta model. Um, as I say, it was intended originally for use with small data analytics, but I think it's a pretty safe bet now that I've done some research that many of the things apply to big data as well. Um, if you're going to be good at small data analytics, you, you have to be concerned with um, how much data you have on different aspects of the business, how integrated is it, how, what's the quality of it, the commonality, um, and the uniqueness, I think, uh, in, in many cases. That's often overlooked. For big data, obviously data is the thing that really sets it apart. And uh, uh, interestingly, there are some differences between the kind of data that people work on, not just the, the, the size or the lack of structure, I'll say more about those in a second, but also, um, Big data is often from the external environment, uh, um, often the internet, but other, other places as well. Um, small data tended to be much more about internal um, uh, processes and decisions around them. Um, the, the whole enterprise approach, I hear probably uh, once a week uh, from an organization that says, yeah, you know, historically we were very fragmented in our in our analytics efforts, but we're starting to let them talk to each other, uh, the, the different groups, and we're getting a little bit more collaboration than we had before. So it's more of an enterprise orientation. Less of that, I would say, in the big data world, in part because a lot of these big data firms are still quite small. Uh, leadership, I'm happy to say, just as important in both. And I, uh, if we have time, I'll give some examples of that. But the uh, interestingly, in a lot of the, the big data companies, the leaders themselves are data scientists. Uh, they have decided that this is important enough so that uh, they need to, to run this business themselves. Uh, one good example, uh, uh, there is a guy um, named Christopher Alberg, who is a uh, uh, Maryland PhD, like you, uh, uh, Dean McGitty. He was in the, this area of data visualization, which uh, Maryland is great at, Ben Schneiderman, a famous professor down there. Uh, he went on to, um, Christopher left Maryland and started a company that did visual analytics called Spotfire, uh, and <coughs> came pretty successful. He sold it to Tibco, another example of selling analytical capabilities to a larger, Vendor, and then he decided that this big data thing was important enough that um, he needed to start a company in that space. So he started a company in the, in the Boston area, in, in fact, in Harvard Square near where I live, called Recorded Future, that attempts to um, discover from internet data what uh, is going to happen in the future. Now, uh, obviously, that's somewhat problematic, but it turns out people on the internet make a lot of predictions uh, about what's going to happen in the future. So if you kind of collect and combine and aggregate and count those predictions, you at least get a pretty good sense of what people are thinking is going to be the future. Um, and uh, there are a variety of organizations, you can imagine that, that financial services firms would be interested in this, and they are. The intelligence community is probably their number one set of customers, and increasingly he was telling me that um, uh, security organizations in companies, uh, heads of security for Walmart and Bank of America and so on are, you know, they kind of want to find out if people on the internet are talking about uh, a riot here and there or a protest here and there and uh, turns out to be pretty useful for those purposes. So an example of a leader who made that transition from small data analytics to, to big ones. Um, and good analytics companies have targets for where they apply their analytical orientation, and I think that's just as true in big data. There is a little bit more in the big data space of people saying, oh, we got this big pile of data, let's see if there's anything good in it. 
um, as opposed to having a business problem and then going out and, and finding the data. So uh, the direction is sometimes a little bit different, but clarity about what you're trying to achieve just as important. And as I will argue, we had these people in the traditional analytics world uh, called quantitative analysts, or sometimes quants for short, um, just as important in big data, although they, they go by this term data scientist. So um, I'll, I'll say more about each of these, but I thought a little introduction might be useful. So uh, the big data term, not a fan uh, in general. Uh, I think we're stuck with it, so uh, I'm not going to argue that we abandon it, but uh, uh, it has a lot of different ideas included uh, in it, and so I always think, well, you know, if there are four different components, what if you have one or two? Uh, do, do you qualify? Uh, if, if big data is about uh, the volume and you may have heard the, the, the three V's definition, uh, big data has lots of volume, it has lots of velocity coming in all the time quickly, it has lots of variety, some people have added veracity, I'm not sure that's a good addition, but in any case, um, uh, what if you only have two of the V's? Uh, is that medium data that you qualify for somehow? Uh, so I think it's problematic in that regard. Uh, it's a relative term in that uh, we say, what's big today? I mean, it's typically we view this as uh, at least, I think, big. To, to be really big, you have to have maybe hundreds of terabytes, petabytes, uh, uh, becoming increasingly uh, discussed in this context. but. Uh, you know, it used to be that, that a megabyte was considered pretty big, I, I recall. So uh, that's going to change over time. Too many people use the big data term to describe just conventional analytics, as I said, the old wine in new bottles idea. So um, I'm not a fan, but I think we're stuck with it for a while. And, and uh, like everybody else, I decided, well, maybe I should do some work in this, in this area. So uh, my definition, uh, data that's either too big typically in terms of petabytes, too unstructured, not in sort of rows and columns, or too diverse, uh, really mashups, uh, to be stored and analyzed by conventional means, also, you know, relative term. Uh, I saw a survey recently with a little consulting firm I did some work with, and they asked people, well, uh, what really gives you the most trouble? Is it the volume? Is it the variety? Is it the velocity? You know, um, and it turned out lack of structure was the biggest issue that they felt really um, made dealing with big data different. It's not so much the volume or the velocity, but the variety and the, la and the lack of structure. So where does this stuff come from? As I suggested, a lot of it comes from the internet, social media, um, online, vast amount of data, lots of uh, potential for analyzing it. Uh, more and more people interested in genomic analysis. Uh, voice and video can be analyzed like any other thing. Images can be analyzed like any other thing. Uh, every uh, industrial device pretty soon, if it doesn't already, is going to have a sensor uh, attached to it that records, you know, what's happening in its environment, how fast is it spinning, and uh, how hot is it, and so on. That generates a massive amount of data. Your refrigerator is going to have uh, a lot of data. Your cell phone already generates a massive amount of data, so there's just no end to this stuff uh, in, the, in the modern world. Um, so I think the key question is, what do we do with big data? And part of what we do is sort of unique, and part is not unique at all. The unique part is uh, the first line up here, how we take big data and turn it from unstructured to structured, classify it, count it, um, et cetera. If you hear people talking about, well, you know, I have a Hadoop cluster and I uh, am taking uh, unstructured data and feeding it into there and, you know, out comes structured data, that's that first step. Uh, and it's often hard to do. It's uh, hard to extract the data from where it exists and get it in a form where you can actually um, analyze it. But once you do, it's not that different from how we previously analyzed data. 
Uh, and people tend to use a lot of the same statistical analyses, the same graphical approaches. So the distinction between small and, and big data is not so much on the analysis related activities, it's on the preparation side. You know, basically how do we take text and video and images and uh, voice and so on and translate it into structured numbers, typically in rows and columns, so that we can make sense out of it all. Uh, hard to make sense out of it in its, in its original form. Okay, so what, what's really different about it? I mean, uh, there is uh, the fact that it's sort of coming all the time, and if you think about it, historically what we wanted to do with data is we wanted to get it into a place that was uh, separate from the rest of the kind of information architecture so that we could subdue it, if you will. We could analyze it, we could make sense of it. Uh, and you know, we called that typically first a database and then a data warehouse and then a data mart, you know, depending on how much volume and so on, but some place that was separate. Uh, well, that doesn't make all that much sense if the stuff just keeps on coming all the time uh, in massive volumes. So um, we're not as able to kind of subdue data in this environment. I think we just need to get used to that idea. Sure, we can sort of sample from it every now and then and you know, take, a, take a teaspoon out of the river and analyze that particular aspect of it and so on. But the idea that we're gonna take that river and divert it into a place where we can analyze it all, you know, it's just going to cause overflow, to, to, to use the water analogy. And so that's one big difference. The people who do this work, I'll talk about them more in a second, but they're data scientists. Now, you know, we're going to see some people saying, I, I met a woman from a Blue Cross Blue Shield organization that said, um, told me at, a, at an analytics conference, handed me your business card, and said, data scientist. I think it even said chief data scientist. Uh, and I said, oh, you know, tell me about your credentials. They sounded suspiciously like a traditional quantitative analyst to me. Um, so I think we're going to see more and more of that kind of thing. But data scientists typically, in addition to the quantitative analysis skills, have some hacking ability. Uh, they bang out code uh, and are pretty, typically pretty creative about how they, they go about it. Uh, they tend to be, you know, we, we thought of quantitative analysts as being advisors to internal decision makers. Uh, in many cases, data scientists are working not on internal decisions, but are working on making cool uh, new products and processes for customers, or at least features of products and processes. So in many cases, they report into a different place, into the product organization for example. Um, uh, and we've got to eventually have some new ways of deciding and acting on it. You know, that data just keeps on coming. You see these great examples of, of um, big data used to uh, support sentiment analysis. What are people saying about my brand? Or who's buying at different hours of the day? Or who's watching different advertisements and so on? You know, we have all this data. The question is, as this sort of data passes by us, this ever-flowing stream, when do we decide we should do something differently? Uh, you know, sentiment of a, about the brand goes up, it goes down, it goes back up, it goes back down. When do we take action? Uh, so I think we haven't, I started my research with the idea that I was gonna look at that particular issue, but frankly, I haven't found a lot of good examples. I sort of make my living by finding heroic activities on the part of business people and writing them down for other business people. And I haven't found those heroic activities yet, but uh, maybe we'll, we'll get to that at, at some point. Um, uh, there are also new technologies that um, need to be around to manage this stuff. So um, all of those uh, structuring tools, they filter, they structure, they classify, they, they can count but not do much analysis. Things like Hadoop and MapReduce and so on are really useful for that, along with these scripting languages like Pig and Hive and Python and, and so on. Um, content analysis tools, a lot of natural language processing capabilities. So if you, um, 
if you saw Watson beat those uh, grand champion experts in Jeopardy, a lot of what was going on there was uh, some very sophisticated forms of natural language processing. Some technologies to deal with this um, amount of data, I mean, it, uh, you probably know that in most corporations, uh, the estimates are uh, around, you know, between 10 and 20 percent of the data is copies of various form types, you know, replicas. Uh, if you're talking about, you know, uh, a few megabytes or even a few hundred megabytes, that's one thing. If you're talking about uh, petabytes and you start replicating it, that gets pretty expensive pretty fast. Um, so we have to deal with that issue. Uh, analytics in the cloud, many people are using because it's kind of infinitely expandable, and particularly these startups don't really want to spend to develop their own server farms. Machine learning, I was, simp I was somewhat resistant to this idea that that was good for analytics because with machine learning you kind of automatically figure out uh, what, what models really fit all of this data and uh, what, what, what are the best fitting models and so on. And I always thought, well, this is not good because you, you no longer have a human who's generated the hypothesis, tested the model, and who's going to defend it to the decision maker and say you should really change your, your actions and your behaviors because this, this model, you know, I found it in the data, fits really well and so on. We don't have that anymore with machine learning. It's all done automatically. But if you're talking about the amount of data, what else are you going to do? I, last night I was with a bunch of uh, uh, marketing people who were talking about the whole digital marketing space. And the CEO of one of the software companies was saying that um, on average, uh, he, his company provides software for deciding what digital ads you want to put in what uh, spaces for them on the web. You know, a lot, lot of uh, online real estate that gets devoted to advertising, somebody's got to decide what's the most likely ad to sell something in that particular context. And uh, so I said, how, how many decisions do you make uh, a week? And he said, well, I don't know about a week. It's about 500 million a second. Uh, hard to do in a kind of a hypothesis generation. Let me study the data. Let's iterate a little bit. Uh, uh, it's a whole new world for this kind of uh, big data um, decision-making environment. Um, and then people really like open source in this world. Uh, I, I think, um, didn't you guys have Jim Goodnight up here at one point from SAS, the CEO of SAS? Um, SAS sponsored some of my research. I should thank them for that, but it's a little tough because I kept talking to these companies, so you guys using SAS? No, no, we're using R. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, they said not only does it work pretty well, it's free, it's open source, but uh, that's what everybody coming out of school wants to use. So, uh, could be quite interesting for the the traditional providers of analytical capabilities, you know, what to do about this free, free option out there. Um, so, data scientists, the sexiest job of the 21st century. What, what are these people like? Well, as I suggested before, they're hybrids. They are part scientist, part hacker, part uh, quantitative analyst. Um, uh, I'd say half focused on data management, but really probably, uh, 80, 90 percent of their time goes to that. Uh, I, I, when I first saw this, I was very envious of this title. I wanted to be a data scientist. But then I started talking to these people, and I realized, you know, data plumbing is more about what's going on here. Um, and I kind of wanted to, um, you know, the famous image of the plumber's crack. Uh, I wanted to use that as my visual metaphor for, for this. Um, but I decided to spare you that. Uh, you can imagine it in your own brain. Uh, but a uh, lot of work. Lot of, the data is dirty in many cases. Takes a lot of effort to try to extract it. And, and so uh, I didn't envy these people quite as much as I did. Uh, many of them have scientific backgrounds. Because you can't be, there are no data science uh, programs in universities. Uh, so how do you find these people? Well, you turn to people like physicists who particularly experimental physicists who 
I, I don't know that much about it, but I guess they, you know, they have their experiments, their apparatus, their, they gather a lot of data. It's typically an unstructured form. They have to be creative about how you, how you put that all together. Um, you see a lot of uh, systems and computational biologists. The statisticians who like this are not the ones who say, you know, just give me a clean data set and let me run my models. These are people who really like mucking around in the, in the depths of the, of the data. And if you're talking about a sort of network-oriented uh, uh, big data application, you know, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, big believers in this stuff, um, the social science backgrounds are, are fairly common, computational social science, if you will. Um, these people are very uh, impatient. They want to change the world now. Uh, they think they're pretty capable of doing it. They try something and, and iterate very quickly. Uh, I, I would ask them, well, how do you work with the IT people to get your data? Oh, <laughs> we want data, we go out and get it ourselves. We don't, we don't mess around with anybody else. Um, one said, you know, I don't, why, I don't know why anybody really wants to hire us. We're kind of a pain in the ass. Um, we uh, are constantly telling you how bad your data is, and uh, it doesn't really matter because we're going to leave in six months anyway because we get five job offers a week, and uh, uh, so uh, they don't stay very long in, in many places. Uh, but still, companies seem to, you know, I, that would make me think, maybe I should get a kind of a data scientist as a consultant or something. But people seem to want to hire their own in many cases. There are some exceptions. I've been talking to this organization, Kaggle, that does competitions. Kind of, you may be familiar with the Netflix prize. Kaggle tries to structure these competitions where you find people to develop the best algorithm for you and, you know, you give them some prize money. You don't have to pay them anything if, you, if uh, they don't meet your criteria. And so, you know, that may be another route to supplying these capabilities. Uh, um, People, they made interesting comments. Nobody's ever done this kind of thing before. You know, we're really, we're really groundbreaking. Uh, if we want to deal with structured data, we'd be on Wall Street, one of them said. Oh, could be the, also the fact that they don't pay quite as much for this on Wall Street as they used to. Um, somebody said, being a consultant is the dead zone. I thought, well, what do you mean by that? Well, all you get to do is, you know, give a presentation or do a report to make a recommendation, but you don't actually make anything. Uh, so I thought that was kind of an interesting comment. The output should be a product or at least a demo, not, not a report or, or a presentation. Uh, so um, what do um, people do with this stuff? Uh, I thought I had a slide here. Oh, I don't know what, what happened to it. This morning I had a, I had a LinkedIn graph that showed the um, number of people employed as quantitative analysts on this page, and I'll, um, I'll um, tell you what it looked like, straight up. Uh, you know, it's kind of going along, and all of a sudden, over the last few years, explosive growth. Uh, it ended, my graphic ended in 2010. I just got the data for 2011. It, instead of going straight up, it goes kind of a little bit <laughs> over like this, but still hugely, hugely steep uh, employment curve. Um, so, um, what are people doing with this stuff? Uh, certainly looking at uh, social media of various types, um, social networks. Uh, one of the, in the article that I co-authored in Harvard Business Review about this, we started with this guy, Jonathan Goldman, um, who was a um, physicist by background, was hired by Reid Hoffman at uh, LinkedIn, and Reid Hoffman became a big believer in data-based management at PayPal. Uh, so he brought in this guy to uh, help them think about some desirable product features. So he came up with this idea that people would be particularly interested in learning about the current status, occupational and otherwise, of people they'd worked with in the past or went to Villanova with or, or whatever. Um, Anybody use people you may know on LinkedIn? Uh, I, I don't know about you, I find this uncanny uh, how it knows people who I've forgotten that I know. And many times I'll look at that person and say, nah, I don't know them. And then I'll uh, figure out, I do know them. How the heck do they know that, that I know them? Um, so um, turns out it uh, initially, the product team didn't really believe this was necessary. They said, well, we have a dress book lookup. Isn't that the same thing? No, it's not the same thing. But um, 
So Reed Hoffman had said, if you have run any problems with the product people, let me know. Jonathan told them that he was getting some pushback. He said, okay, I'll give you a little ad space on the LinkedIn uh, uh, home page um, that can advertise this capability. Let's see how interested people are in it. Turns out they were fantastically interested. It's estimated that people you may know has added two or three million uh, new customers to LinkedIn. So, um, and, and now everybody has it. I think LinkedIn is still the best, but there's one on uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter and so on. Uh, uh, they also in, in LinkedIn have developed jobs you may be interested in, groups you may want to join. So they've kind of, the data science team, which is over 100 people now, has done some really interesting stuff. You can see some of these other things. Voice analytics, I mentioned, uh, text analytics, uh, particularly in that area of sentiment analysis, warranty analysis, people have been doing now for about a decade or so. Um, more and more video all over the place. So um, in every, every sport uh, from uh, base, professional baseball, bas basketball, football, every play is uh, recorded via video. Uh, we don't have enough people to watch all of this stuff, so we're gonna have to have, and organizations are developing video analytics to analyze it. Uh, you go into a store, there are, you know, you'll see all these cameras and, and many of them are starting to analyze, well, how, what percentage of people actually picked up a package and then did they actually buy or not? First application was just how many people came into the store um, and hence we can figure out conversion rates and so on. So a lot going on in the video space, a lot of um, organizations looking at genome data, how that relates to particular cancers and other drugs and, I mean, other diseases and, and so on. So, um, those are sort of uh, the general class of, of things. So some companies that are early adopters of this, eBay. Every time I talk to eBay, I just changed this. Last week I found out I, I'd had 36 petabytes, now it's up to 40. And now they're saying, yeah, fine, you can keep reporting this number if you want, but we have far more data in our Hadoop clusters than that. Um, so uh, maybe it's becoming irrelevant, but um, uh, they have particularly focused on this issue of how do we control this proliferation of copies of data. So they created this virtual data mart idea um, using a, a Teradata warehouse that it doesn't, I'm not sure exactly how it works in detail, but it basically, it doesn't, if you want an extract of a, of a data set or something, it doesn't create a new one, it just gives you a view into it. And so it just does, doesn't replicate so much. Um, they um, are, use Hadoop and MapReduce, R for statistical analysis. They decided that the human aspect of this was pretty important, so um, we need to leverage the productivity of our data scientists. So let's develop a kind of, they call it a um, data hub. It's sort of a portal to things that people have already done, data sets that people might find useful, you know, et cetera. Uh, GE is pretty interesting in this regard. So every time I go back to GE, they don't tell me about their, their petabytes uh, increasing. They tell me about the amount of money that they're spending on this topic increasing. Uh, so uh, they start out saying we're going to spend a billion dollars on, on analytics and software, a new center in, in the Bay Area. Uh, and every time I talk to them, oh, now it's a billion and a half, now it's two billion. So last time they told me, well, you can't put this on the slide, but I think it's closer to two and a half uh, we're gonna spend. 400 data scientists are gonna, they're gonna hire, already hired a couple of hundred. Um, they're, and, you know, they have financial businesses, GE Capital, and they're interested in some marketing um, data, but the primary initial focus is on industrial uses. How do I, how do I figure out the optimum time to service a locomotive. Well, you gotta sort of extract data from all the many sensors. I talked to one guy, he said, I spent six months trying to suck data off an alternator, um, uh, a locomotive alternator. So you get a sense of uh, how complex this can be to figure out what part's most likely to break next and when you service it. But this is, you know, this GE sells these products, but they make money off the service. And so optimizing the service is really critical for, for them. So I think it's really interesting, company as big as this, I also heard Jeff Inmelt um, started a Twitter account 
uh, about a month ago. I was very jealous. My co-author on this article about data scientists was the, I don't know, either the third or fourth person he followed on Twitter. So for the CEO of General Electric, one of the world's largest companies, to be following the Twitter feeds of a data scientist, eh, it kind of tells you, tells you something interesting. I thought my Twitter feeds were pretty interesting too, but he apparently did not. Uh, <laughs> Uh, EMC, um, Boston-based company, getting into this from a, kind of mentioned earlier, from an acquisition standpoint, but also saying, you know, we need data scientists. Uh, they believe, as I do, that the gating factor on, on big data is the people to do it. I mean, the data is everywhere and the software is free. It's the people that are going to hold us back. So they developed a course for both their employees and for customers to try to create an online course to try to create more data scientists. Um, I think, I think you, universities can get it. It's not, not a fantastic course, but you know, it's better than nothing. Uh, using some of them internally, and interestingly enough, I was talking to this guy at EMC last night who was telling me this whole culture of EMC is changing. EMC, despite being in the computer storage business, was one of the least analytical companies I had ever worked with. I mean, uh, very power, politics, hierarchy oriented, but now every, everything is data. You know, do you have data to support that decision? Every manager at EMC has to pass a test, a proficiency test on analytical decision making, uh, which you couldn't have dreamed that that would happen a few years ago. So. Um, Interesting from a variety of perspectives. And here's one of the small companies, Quid, San Francisco based, kind of like Recorded Future, that company I mentioned earlier, analyzing internet data to sort of figure out what are the unexplored domains for product development for technology companies. So working with Microsoft, they found out that there was an unexplored opportunity. It's that yellow space in the visual map up there at the intersection of biopharma, social media, gaming, and ad targeting, which I kind of would have thought was the null set, but they think not, apparently. They think there are some real things at that intersection. Uh, and also, again, working with uh, you know, intelligence organizations. Interestingly, their argument is, um, that if you are a consultant, a strategy consultant, a planning consultant, uh, that it, it's almost becoming strategic malpractice not to look at what's going on on the internet uh, in a systematic way to inform strategic decisions. And I think you know, that may well be true. Um, I, the big consulting firms haven't really done this in a huge way yet in their strategy practices, but I suspect they will. Uh, so just a summary of how these uh, big and small data analytics compare. Uh, I said big data often external, small data internal. Big data often part of a product or service. Small data is used to manage and make internal decisions. So, so the focus is different. Uh, both require good relationships, but di with different people. As I said, typically for small data, it's internal decision makers uh, for Big data people, it's new product developers, maybe CTOs, uh, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the technologies, as I said, uh, uh, very different between the two in terms of data management tools um, and the analysis tools tend to be similar, although big data um, tends to make more use of visual analytics. Everybody's very excited about Tableau, Spotfire to a somewhat lesser degree. I mentioned the open source thing. Um, so um, the problem with a lot of this stuff is that uh, the people are expensive. Uh, if, if it takes six months to suck data from a locomotive alternator, that kind of tells you how labor intensive this process can, can be. Uh, uh, you know, in a way, I think the history of computer-based analytics is one of more and more abstraction. You kind of get further and further away from the, from the data and individual data points and so on. But uh, as one statistician who worked in both camps said to me, there's not a lot of abstraction here. You know, we've got to get really close to the data to figure out what's going on. The third issue is that big data often equals small math. Why? Well, 
doesn't seem to be a lot of energy left over for uh, crunching the data in a serious way if you've had to struggle so much to just get it out of uh, whatever form it's in into a, a form suitable for analysis. Now, some people have also argued because the data is new and different and so on, just being able to count it is often enough. That's one of the reasons why visual analytics is used so much. Visual analytics typically not so great for complex multidimensional um, statistical models. Um, so if you're just counting stuff, visual analytics is great, and that's uh, what, what a lot of people are doing. So I think we'll get there, but right now um, the, the goal is kind of produce a nice visualization. Maybe someday we'll do serious analytics. Uh, lots of interfaces and integration. I think in general the, both the technologies are going to change a lot over the um, next several years. Um, and the people are going to become much more available. And I, I was saying to the um, advisory board for the, the analytics center, uh, you know, it used to be if you wanted uh, quants in finance, you, you had to kind of get the same sort of people you have as data scientists. They had PhDs in physics or whatever. You teach them a little bit about finance and off they'd go doing their algorithms. Now, we, most organizations would say, yeah, I'll go to, uh, you know, the many universities have financial engineering master's programs and that's probably good enough. And I think eventually we'll have the same thing for data scientists, but we don't, we don't yet. Um, so um, there are some things in these organizations have in common. Leadership, you had Gary Loveman, uh, Reid Hoffman, who has a similar physique to Gary Loveman's, um, uh, is playing the same sort of role that Gary Loveman did in the, um, in the small data analytics space and is telling everybody, you know, the future of our industry, uh, analyzing web data, is pretty much uh, uh, a data-based phenomenon. Uh, there's some other similarities around, I, I should probably say a little bit, I'm going to skip a page or two about um, uh, one thing that it seems to be happening, uh, uh, I, I'm doing this for you primarily, Anthony, because it says SAP HANA up there, but um, uh, this HANA and um, high performance analytics, the thing that, a a an idea that SAS is talking about. Teradata talks a lot about in database processing. Little bit less on totally new kinds of data, but dr dramatic acceleration of previous activity um, uh, that you know, we already did. So maybe it's uh, uh, being able to get real-time data on how your sales force is performing out of your SAP HANA system instead of waiting for a daily or weekly or quarterly report. Uh, SAS is optimizing pricing at Macy's. It used to take 19 hours to run all their SKUs. Now it's 19 minutes. Um, uh, Cabela's doing propensity scoring for every one of their customers in, in a few seconds rather than weeks. So the question is, what do you do with that extra time? Uh, Jim Goodnight, uh, who is renowned for uh, his uh, bold remarks, I think you probably noticed when he came here, said, well, take a vacation, go out and play golf. Uh, um, but I think most or business organizations would probably figure out a more value-adding use of that extra time, and it, you know, you can do things like run more models or uh, try new types of data in all that time to try to increase the lift of the models that you, that you do run. So there are some other similarities. The, the personalities have some things in common. Uh, people, you still need people who can tell a story with data, not just uh, analyze data, not just tell stories, but tell a story using data. That's a tough skill that many uh, people haven't acquired. Uh, be courageous. Uh, Chevron says their analysts need to be courageous. And I ran across somebody in the big data space the other day said, we hire our analysts in part for their courage, our, our data scientists, who are willing to sort of push back and say, no, that's not what the data really are telling us. Uh, helping to frame the decision rather than just you know, going off and, and doing the back office work on it. And more and more people are doing agile methods here where you come back really quickly with some sort of uh, result 
uh, and it's when we got nationwide insurance and said, we, we strive for one result per week now in our analytics work because, you know, we gotta move at the, at the speed of business. Um, so I'm gonna skip a couple of pages here. This is mostly about prototyping and, and so on. Uh, uh, if, if you think this is appealing, then again, you know, as I said, leadership is very critical. Make sure your leaders are on board. Figure out where you wanna target this activity. Uh, I think you don't necessarily have to go out and hire a bunch of data scientists now, but you can. So there are consulting organizations emerging who will help you with this. Assess your technology and you know, what data sources do you have and start thinking about, well, what decisions could I improve, whether it's with small data or big, or um, are there products and processes that are gonna be uh, changed dramatically by this? Do not make the mistake, though, of an organization I was talking to, this is the head of R&D at a large um, automotive company. And I said, what do you think about this self-driving car uh, thing? Uh, you know, um, Google has described that as, you know, just a big data problem. You know, we have all the sensors and the images coming in. We have to kind of crunch all that data and time to make rapid decisions and so on. And he said, I think we're gonna leave the innovating in that area to Google. Bad idea. Um, with that, I will simply stop uh, talking. If anybody has any comments or questions, love to, love to hear them. Thank you.